thanks. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, as always, and to see you. And uh, so, you know, let's dive in. In 378 days, we'll know and what happened. And uh, of course, there's a lot to take part in and a lot to happen in the meantime. And I'm sure you're counting because, as we see, there's only 103 days to the Iowa caucuses. And so that's, you know, that's exciting. But that's really uh, the first real test of who has traction uh, among the Democrats that are, are left standing. Uh, there's really no real opposition to Trump this time. Jeff Flake has no traction whatsoever. Hey, uh, well, the same thing. Uh, so uh, it's going to be really uh, the Democratic side that we find out. Uh, that will be the end of the road for some of the candidates, however many are standing. Uh, if, if you can't really make at least 6 to 10% or more in the Iowa caucuses, you're probably not going anywhere. So that's, that's the first test. That's a mere 103 days away, uh, as you can make it that long. If you make it eight more days, the New Hampshire primary, which is the first actual primary uh, to take place. There is a big difference between caucuses and primaries. Uh, the Iowa caucuses uh, are actually kind of entertaining. If you've ever actually seen them, uh, we could actually be a caucus group. You generally meet in places like uh, gyms or living rooms or whatever else. Uh, you argue for about an hour. Okay, and then uh, if you're in the gym, they actually have signs for whatever candidate you want to uh, support. You go under, stand under the sign. People get to yell at you for the next 20 minutes trying to get you <laughs> under their sign. And then somebody calls time, and then they count the numbers. Okay, and that's the idea. And I'm not lying. That's how the Iowa caucus works. Okay, so it's really kind of old-style politics. Uh, but it's interesting. As opposed to a primary, which operates much like an election, a, a secret ballot, which is very different than a caucus, and, uh, and it gives us a little bit different perspective on the candidates. Uh, that's actually February 11th, and again, that will be the end of the road uh, for some more. If, again, you don't show well, particularly if you don't show well in both places, uh, then generally money dries up and things like that. So we will see. Only 129 days to the South Carolina primary, which is important because roughly half of South Carolina's Democratic voters are people of color. Uh, so that will be the first real test of who is going to have traction with that very important Democratic constituency. And of course, in the, in the South in general, the South has gone Republican now since pretty much the Reagan days, uh, but there's a lot of hope among the Democratic Party particularly that this might be the year uh, when they can get enough uh, minority voters particularly registered to the polls and maybe start flipping some of those states. And uh, the South Carolina primary may be a test of whether that happens or not. And also, again, who in the Democratic Party uh, may have some strength there. We'll come back to that thought in a little bit. And then uh, just three days after that, very important, is the first of the super uh, primaries, the first Super Tuesday. And this one is important. Uh, because both California and Texas moved their primary dates up. California used to be in June, so they were irrelevant. By that time, the candidates were chosen. Uh, they wanted to be more important in the delegate process this time around, um, so they jumped up into the March primary. Uh, Texas did the same thing. They are the two delegate-rich, most delegate-rich states for both parties. Okay, so, uh, so that's important. And we may actually know, there, there are 14 other states involved as well, uh, we might know that early, uh, who actually is going to be uh, the candidate. And certainly, uh, if I were sitting at the head of the DNC, I would want to know by that date, because you've got a lot of work to do between then and November. If you have to go all the way out to June uh, with contested primaries, uh, that makes your job a lot more difficult. Yeah, because you still have that internal uh, problem in your party. And uh, I don't know about you, I'm actually not all that excited, but it's a great picture. <laughs> so, but uh, nonetheless. Now, how do we get to a primary system, and what exactly are primaries? Uh, where do they come from? If we go back in political history far enough, uh, everything was basically decided uh, by party bosses for a lot longer than most people think, particularly in the presidential uh, elections. It was really into the 1970s. Uh, the primary system was actually enacted during the progressive era at the turn of the last century to try to take political choice out of the hands 
of these political bosses, particularly guys like this, this is boss Tweed, um, and also to get them out of the, the so-called ward bosses uh, that ran the neighborhood organizations. Those were run by caucus also, but the caucus there was an open vote. So in fact, if boss Tweed and two guys who were about seven feet tall, 300 pounds, brand new knuckles on the ground, told you who you're going to vote for, that's who you voted for. And you had no choice. So the progressives came along and said, no, it's got to, we really have to give power back to the people. So they actually enacted, it was called the Wisconsin Idea, Robert La Follette uh, was one of the first, Tom L. Johnson, the, the uh, mayor of Cleveland at that time, enacted local uh, secret ballot primaries to try to defeat the party bosses. And, and, uh, and it started out very slowly and did not really become the presidential way until the 1970s. And that was a function of uh, the, the very chaotic 1968 Democratic primary which most, or, uh, convention, which most of us remember, that was the riots uh, with uh, Mayor Daley and all that sort of stuff. Hubert Humphrey actually won the, uh, the uh, uh, nomination without winning a single primary. And there were only 16 primaries anyway. Okay, so it was still a matter of party bosses. Um, so people like uh, when John F. Kennedy ran, when Johnson ran, uh, Hubert Humphrey himself, they actually had to go visit the states and visit the uh, head of the state party and pretty much sell themselves to the state party. And then there was generally a state party caucus that selected the delegates uh, who often were unbound. They, 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 might, they could arrive at the convention without having a, a definitive delegate. Uh, so there's a lot of horse trading went on. These are the classic smoke-filled rooms, you know, full of men with cigars making deals. And that was really still the way right up through about 1968. And at that point, both parties said, oh, we've got to do some changing here uh, because that just isn't working, especially as these conventions got more television coverage. Uh, that became very important. So through the 70s and the 80s, these primaries begin to slowly gain more importance, but it's still an evolving process at that point. In 1972, between 68 and 72, the Democratic Party decided that they really needed to put some order to their, their primary and their nominating procedure, so they put George McGovern in charge of that. And George McGovern, in fact, rewrote all the rules and then used the rewritten rules to gain the nomination. And, and, uh, and that did not go well with the party bosses, because even in 1972, they really didn't think he was electable. Okay, the, the populace, through the primary system, voted for him, uh, but again, the party itself uh, was not wild about that choice. Uh, so that, uh, again, at this point, uh, they, they begin to think changing uh, our primary system again. The danger of a primary system, Republicans also had primaries, uh, but a number of the primaries at that point, most of them were what were called non-binding primaries. We'll run a primary uh, that will tell the delegates, potential delegates, who the people of our state would prefer, but when they get to the convention, they can vote the way they want. And that turned out to be a disaster for the Republicans in 1976. You had a sitting president, President Ford, uh, who, who had to hold off the challenge uh, from Ronald Reagan, you know, governor of California. When the convention actually started, they were very close. Ford was ahead, but did not have uh, the plurality to gain the nomination. So there was a very ugly floor fight uh, that took place and it actually centered on the delegates from Mississippi who had, uh, in the non-binding primary, had been pledged to Reagan, but in the back rooms, uh, they actually got flipped over to Ford. Uh, so there's a lot of dissatisfaction. And of course, that was on national television, which did not look good. Okay? So you don't want a floor fight on national television. So both parties, after 1976, begin to move away from the idea uh, that we're going to end up with floor fights, and they, they move their primaries around and make them much more important. So that uh, by 1992, uh, the Democrats began running binding primaries in 40 of the states, the Republicans in 39, and that number has actually grown since then. There are still some party boss states. Uh, they're rare today, uh, but the primary system has developed over this time. Now, once primaries were established, uh, then it became an idea of, all right, who's going to have the first one? Because all candidates are going to pay attention to us if we're first. So New Hampshire actually passed a state law that they must be the first primary. And that got to be interesting as other states 
started moving their primaries first back to March, <coughs> and then to February, and then to January. And, and uh, so they, they still had to be first. And uh, so there was all sorts of disorder there. And of course, in, in the, the real global sense of things, uh, these early primaries, particularly the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary, give a great deal of importance to states that in the Electoral College really just aren't that important. But we will see, particularly over the next 103 days, every potential candidate will be sitting down in a coffee shop in Iowa somewhere, or in a truck stop in New Hampshire. And then after the primaries are over, they will not return to those states at all. Okay, but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Now, by the mid-90s, we had states starting to think, all right, we're not important anymore, and we need to be. And it was actually a collection of southern states first that came up with the idea of a super primary. We will all hold our primaries on the same day to give regional importance to a candidate and also to get our, our dates out there and become important. So we started to see these super primaries, uh, particularly in the South originally. By 2008, uh, the uh, pretty much nomination is over by March. Okay? And on the one hand, that's good because your candidate can then actually start running on the national platform without uh, running against their own mates from the party. Uh, on the other hand, it makes the later primaries irrelevant, and they do go through June. Again, particularly up until this year, California uh, was one of the last primaries, and they have the most delegates in both parties and did not like being irrelevant. So they have jumped themselves up uh, in this case. New Jersey is still one of the last ones. New Jersey is our densest populated uh, major state. You can argue that Rhode Island is as well. Uh, but uh, you have a very densely populated state that really doesn't count much because uh, by then the uh, primaries are pretty much uh, in. In 2012, just a few years ago, both parties finally enacted rules that no primary or caucus could take place before February 1st and then only in four states. And the four states were chosen mostly New Hampshire and Iowa because they are, uh, were traditional. And they were early primary states in the history of primaries and caucuses. Um, so they got to retain their position. But in fact, neither state is terribly representative of the country. So they actually chose two other states, Nevada and South Carolina, that they felt were a little bit more reflective of the changes that were taking place in our population. Okay, and also giving some importance, particularly uh, in South Carolina, giving a lot more importance to minority voters. Okay, so they, they, but those are the only four. Okay, and then after March, it's free for all. Okay, you can choose whatever date you want. And again, California and Texas moved to that March 3rd primary so that their vote would be much more important. You want the candidates to come to your state. Okay, you want them to try to come in. Uh, there are deals that are made um, at this point to try to get the, uh, uh, the populace behind you. Party bosses are still important. They don't sway like they used to, uh, but they're still important. And so you try to, to kind of woo that state uh, with whatever promises you're going to make. But it is the New Hampshire primary that's actually the first uh, primary. Now, in the 70s, of course, George McGovern again ran in 1972, got crushed. Jimmy Carter, remember, was also an outsider. And he also used the new primary rules that were enacted after 1972. Jimmy Carter effectively moved to Iowa in 1975 so that he could campaign for a full year. It was successful. Virtually nobody in the country knew who he was. He was the former governor of Georgia. Uh, and that was about all people knew. And all of a sudden, he's a major candidate. And, and uh, he wins, of course, in 76. But he, in turn, also gets crushed in 1980. And again, he's an outsider candidate. He was not the preferred candidate of the party. Neither was uh, McGovern. So going into the 1984 primary, the Democratic Party creates what's called a superdelegate. And it depends on how many there are uh, year to year. They are elected officials generally, or former elected officials. So among the superdelegates, for instance, uh, would be Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, uh, uh, de Blasio, city of, of New York mayor, um, other important governors, Jimmy Carter, uh, Barack Obama, former presidents, important former senators, all uh, members of Congress who are Democrats, all members of the Senate who are Democrats as well, uh, both Senate and House, they're all superdelegates. And, and uh, then there are a certain number of party officials as well. And uh, they were basically, their job was pretty much to make sure the party didn't make a mistake. 
okay, that, uh, that the party actually nominated somebody who could be elected. Now, from 84 up until this last election cycle in 2016, uh, they pretty much did what the party wanted done uh, because that's how the people voted. Last election cycle, there was an interesting problem. Um, in 2016, Bernie Sanders actually won percentage-wise and raw vote-wise a number of primaries, but the superdelegates, uh, who often outnumbered the regular delegates, uh, all were on the Clinton side. And the one that uh, is pointed to most, this is actually from uh, New Hampshire, where Bernie actually won 16.5% of the vote. Uh, Hillary Clinton only won 38%, but she ended up tied in the delegate count uh, because she won all the superdelegates uh, who committed. And uh, so they are not bound, or at least at that point, were not bound by what the states did. After that controversy, and of course, there are a lot of accusations that the DNC miscounted votes. There's a, still a lot of anger in California. Uh, a lot of uh, Bernie fans think that he won the California primary, but that the DNC stole it so that Hillary would have enough, uh, enough, candidate, enough uh, delegates. And, and uh, whether there's any truth to that doesn't matter. It's what they believe. And, and so to try to ease that, in this election cycle, there are still superdelegates, but they are now bound to the states, uh, at least so far. They're bound to the state's results. Okay, so they're still there, and we'll, we'll see how that, how that plays out. The Republicans don't have superdelegates, but they do have uncommitted delegates, and they're essentially the same. Okay, so in our area, John Katko is actually an, an, un, an unrestricted delegate, I think they call them. Um, so when he goes to the Republican National Convention this year, he can vote for anybody he wants. And, and uh, he's, he's not tied in. Whereas there is a Republican primary, uh, and it's a binding primary, you have to go and vote. At least, generally, generally the rule is two rounds. Um, you have to vote for whoever it is the people have told you to vote for. Then it's up to the states. Um, then you can, uh, if after two rounds, you release your delegates, they can vote for anybody they want. And uh, so far, uh, in the last, now almost 40 years, nobody has reached that stage. All of our conventions have nominated on the first round since 1976. And there's really no reason to think that this one will be any different. But it is, it is a potential. So, uh, okay, we apparently have a connection of some sort here. And uh, give me a second and I'll get rid of that, I think. <laughs> oh, that's harder to do than it used to be. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> get any better. <laughs> Uh, our grit me stuff is not fun. <laughs> okay, now, this problem. Our current election cycle is two out of four years. And it started uh, over at the beginning of this year, a full two years before the election. Uh, that favors voter apathy. And what is often now referred to as voter fatigue. You actually get tired of what's happening out there. And that is certainly a factor. It's an important factor. You have uh, news out there that's trying to make for two years, trying to make every political event important. And in fact, they're just not. And, and after you, it's like the boy who cried wolf. You know, how many times can something be vital? You know, can something be that important over a two-year stretch? Uh, generally, it just isn't. So what tends to happen uh, voters get bored, okay? or they get confused. Uh, there are too many issues, there's too much uh, going on, and, and they just lose interest. And that affects these primaries. By the time the primaries arrive, 90% of registered voters will not vote in a primary. So your primary, your candidate is being selected by 10% of your party. Okay? And even with open primaries, which a lot of states are going to, uh, still, the numbers are awful. They, they, they may vote for one side or the other as opposed to whoever they're registered for, but we're still running at about 10%. And on the general election side, uh, we are barely cracking 60%. And in the last few elections, more people failed to vote than voted for the winning candidates. And those are serious issues. And part of the problem, there are lots of, of causes, but part of the problem is this idea of voter fatigue. You know, we are just wearing out voters. Uh, you, you may or may not be aware, our Canadian neighbors had an election and, uh, that was settled yesterday. Trudeau got re-elected. Their election cycle is six weeks. They, and, so, and, and it's done, it's done efficiently. They also have a cap on the money. 
okay, that can be spent. We're going to talk about money here in a couple of minutes. So primaries then don't necessarily reflect much of anything in a way. They don't necessarily reflect the majority view of the public or the party. What they reflect is who shows up at the polls, which is a function of democracy and an important one. But who generally then is going to vote? Who are the 10%? Basically, they're the energized. And whatever has energized them, it brings them out. Okay? Now, that might be a candidate, okay, like a Bernie Sanders. Uh, it might be a philosophy, like the Tea Party. Uh, the resulting candidate, however, uh, may be much further right or left than the general voting public is, even in that region or state. And that creates a problem. Uh, if they may or may not win general elections. Uh, again, going to looking at a, a history of the Tea Party, um, especially when you look at, at some of the Midwestern states, uh, the candidates that were being chosen in primaries were simply not electable. Okay, the general public was like, are you kidding me? And this never happened. Um, and if they are elected, they tend to be minorities within their own party. Nobody else in the party wants to deal with them either because they're so far right or left and that, that they're basically irrelevant. So they become gadflies instead of effective legislators. Some have longer legs than others. Many of them are turned out of office in the next cycle or the one after that. Every now and then, one of them will last a long time. Uh, but if you doubt that they are a problem, ask John Boehner or Paul Ryan or Nancy Pelosi, all of whom have had to deal with a, a strong, small minority group who holds enough power to throw off the party. Okay, right now, it's Nancy Pelosi's problem with the progressives. Before that, it was the Tea Party for Boehner and Ryan. Okay, so there, it's an interesting process that takes place. Uh, not sure what the cure is, but we may well see that again in this primary uh, cycle, where you have, particularly the Democratic Party, you have a very strong progressive Democratic group. Do they really represent mainstream Democrats in mainstream states, particularly in a very vital Midwest uh, where the election is really going to be decided this year? Um, and that's, that's an important question. At the presidential level, remember, Trump was an outsider. He was not the party's chosen by any means. He's a renegade. Uh, and he easily defeated the heir presumptive, and he always followed the money. Who did the Republicans want? They wanted Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush raised $126 million in six weeks. Okay, that tells you who the power Republicans wanted in that nomination spot. He got crushed. He never got above 6% in the polls. Okay, Donald Trump's style is really what carried him as much as his message. Okay, uh, Jeb Bush just never got any traction in that. Um, so Republicans, by and large, were stuck with a winner that most of them didn't want and still don't want. Okay, and yet they're stuck with him. Okay, and it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma okay, among especially long-standing Republicans. You know, how do you defend this president um, who's leading your party but you really don't like? And it's not a new problem. Uh, that's been, there are others. Clinton had the same issue uh, in the 90s with the Democrats. Uh, uh, Carter, of course, others before that. Reagan, to a certain degree. Bernie Sanders, of course, fired up the Democrats. Okay? And, and fired up particularly younger Democrats and so forth. Uh, then when he lost, that group just didn't warm up to Hillary Clinton. And they did not help her. They, they did not contribute to her by, primarily, and in many cases, they did not vote for her either. Okay, and this was the Bernie or Bust crew. They, they, again, they tended to be younger voters, but not exclusively. Now, did they cause her to lose the election? That would be a long stretch, but they certainly didn't help, particularly in states like Michigan, Wisconsin. You know, they would have been solidly Democratic states, and suddenly, by very narrow percentages, uh, go over to the Trump camp in the last election. You know, would the Bernie or Bust crowd, if they had voted, would they have turned the election? Quite possible. And this is a problem. Again, many of them think, and still think, that the election was stolen from their candidate. And this is a problem of, uh, call them for lack of something better, fringe candidates. And they get very loyal followers. Will the loyal followers maintain that loyalty to the party or not? And the answer, so far, um, using this example, is no. Okay, and that, that could have some really interesting impact on this election as well. With this very crowded Democratic field, uh, will they produce a candidate who can defeat Donald Trump? Okay, or will it be a candidate who is chosen by the 10%, uh, who are excited for whatever reason? Okay, will they self-destruct? 
through the infighting to get the nomination, leaving this hopelessly divided party. And whoever becomes the, uh, the candidate is going to have to go to nine other constituencies within the party and convince them to come vote for him or her. Okay, that's a, a tall order. It's a tall order. And it's going to be interesting. And in the new era, of course, who's electable and who's not is an open question. If anybody had told you eight years ago that Donald Trump was going to be your president, okay, you'd have laughed. Okay, before that, that's not new, by the way. Before that, you go back into the 60s, and if somebody told you that Ronald Reagan was going to be president, they'd have laughed you out of the room also. Okay, but we're in an era where all of a sudden, we're not really sure anymore. Okay, so as the magic eight ball says, reply is hazy. Ask again later. Okay, so, yeah, we'll see. Now, what's happening now with the debates? Are they helping? Number you asked me before, are the debates helping or hurting? Okay, well, let's think about it. Okay, now, the Democratic field, since I talked to you last in the spring, remember at that point we had 23 candidates. Now, there are still 23 out there, but the party has, has eliminated it through the structure of those debates. Remember now, you have to have raised so much money. You have, have to have had uh, so many contributors in 20 states, and you have to be doing well in certain polls that the party has selected either two national polls or four regional polls uh, for the Democrats at this point. Uh, the top tier has certainly narrowed, okay, and it's come down to three. Elizabeth Warren, uh, Joe Biden, and Bernie Sanders. Uh, in polling order, that's where they are right now. Uh, very close for Biden and Warren, but, but that's where they are. Sanders is actually a fairly distant third at this point, but he is third. You have a second tier also, uh, and they are struggling, but they're there. Uh, that would include Pete Buttigieg, uh, uh, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar, and Cory Booker. The rest are just hoping to make it to Iowa. They, uh, Andrew Yang is interesting, uh, to say the least, but, uh, but he's not tr getting any traction in the polls. Um, and they're hoping, of course, that they can make it to Iowa, that they might be able to actually gain a little traction in those Iowa caucuses by going to the coffee shops and the donut shops and the gas stations and all that sort of stuff. Okay, and uh, so, so we'll see. But one of the measures, and we've talked about this before, and it is crucially important, who's got money? And that tells us a great deal. It's not the be-all and end-all, but it tells us a great deal about who is gaining traction with either donors, uh, in the case of somebody like Bernie Sanders, who doesn't accept big money, but he's got a lot of money, so he's got a lot of support, or the power players in the party, uh, which uh, it right now is uh, kind of an interesting set. There's an interesting issue that came up in the last week. <coughs> 16 election watchdog groups, and, uh, all of them know groups like the League of Women Voters, Open Secrets, uh, nonpartisan groups primarily, have requested all candidates on both sides uh, to reveal who their so-called bundlers are. Now, most people have no idea that there's a such thing as a bundler in politics. We do know that because of one of the outcomes of Citizens United, uh, there actually is a cap on an individual's contribution to a single political campaign or, uh, or party. Uh, that's $5,600. Okay, so that limits people. But there is no limit to how many of you, after I give my $5,600, how many of you I can try to convince to also give $5,600 and then that gets basically bundled. I'm responsible for that, and that gets turned over to the candidate. Okay, so basically, I'm a fundraiser, okay, is what a bundler is. Okay, and there are all kinds of, this is not new either, but they can be responsible for hundreds of thousands of dollars, really, depending on how large their connections are. And uh, what these groups want to know, okay, there's no requirement, by the way, these people do not have to report to the FEC. They have to report their own contribution, but I don't have to report how many people I've gotten in my club okay, to, uh, to give. I don't have to do that, unless they're a registered lobbyist. Okay, then they have to. So these groups are asking for transparency. Okay, who are your bundlers? And especially want to know who are the bundlers who have raised more than $50,000 for your campaign? Because that may be they can favor one way or another uh, with you. Now, Andrew Yang says, I don't have any bundlers, okay, and he well may not. Uh, Warren and Sanders have kind of sidestepped the issue. 
I don't have any official bundlers. Okay? That doesn't mean they're not out there. Uh, they're just not officially part of the campaign. Uh, Harris does update hers quarterly, and she definitely has them. Uh, Pete Buttigieg actually updated as of April, but has not revealed where he is uh, at the moment, who his bundlers are. Uh, now, no one else has responded, including Joe Biden uh, and Donald Trump, who at the time that this request was made were both leading in the polls. According to sources, and they're pretty good sources, Trump actually has at least 400 bundlers they, that are working either through his campaign or through the Republican National Committee. That's a huge number. Yeah. And that is a huge number. Uh, a few of them have gone public because that helps them raise money. Some of them actually are registered lobbyists, so they actually are, are required. So we do know who some of them are. Uh, and some of them are former Democratic bundlers, okay, which tells us a great deal. The business community is not particularly happy with what's happening in the Democratic Party right now, especially people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who have a very definitive anti-business bent to what they're, they're bringing out to their supporters. Um, so there has been some, some interesting flipping that may or may not have outcome, but it does mean money, okay, and sometimes big money in this case. Trump and the RNC have raised $100 million in the second quarter alone. Okay, that is a massive amount of money. That's three months. Okay, and remember, we're still a year away from the actual election. So if they're able to raise that in the second quarter, a year ahead, what are they going to be able to raise as we get closer and closer to the election? Okay, this, this, this is big, serious money. His long connections into the business world and the financial world are certainly paying off. He knows a lot of these people personally. And again, the bundlers in turn know people that he doesn't know. And so they are, they're really important. It also is to his advantage that he has no rivals that are going to siphon off uh, significant contributions. And that's not true for any of the Democratic Party. They're, they're all in competition with each other right now for basically the same body of fundraisers. Okay, so, so Trump has an enormous advantage in that. Uh, people in financial houses right now, banks, insurance companies, uh, they are feeling under attack from the Democrats, uh, particularly Sanders and Warren. Uh, again, as Warren rises in the polls, uh, that's, that's good news if you're a Warren fan. It's not necessarily good news if you're a Democratic fundraiser. Okay, because a lot of the former big money Democrats, they may not flip to the Republican side, but they're holding. Okay, they're, they're also not contributing at this point. Um, it's interesting, we, we found that out uh, uh, recently at, at Oasis, just to give you an idea. Uh, one of the uh, contributors to Oasis traditionally are some of the big insurance companies. They're not contributing at the moment because they're not sure what they can do with their money should one of the progressive Democrats win. Okay, so, so they're holding fast, so there is economic impact. So what happens to the money after they get the candidates get the money? Do they keep it for forever? Or they, uh, they can keep it in a campaign fund forever. They cannot turn it over to themselves. That rule changed in 1988. And 1988 as of 1988, you can keep it as personal income. And you notice that in 1988, a whole lot of senators and congressmen retired. <laughs> uh, they, uh, because that was the last year they could actually keep it. So Hillary Clinton actually still has I think she's sitting on something like 45 or 50 million dollars, but it's tied to the campaign. Now she can give it to other campaigns. They can direct where the money goes. Within within the, with the, the confines of the law, yes. Okay, a certain amount of it can certainly be used for, for campaign salaries, things like that. That's limited. Um, they can contribute to other campaigns uh, up to certain amounts. Uh, it's not exactly dark money, but it's, it's money that's not uh, registered exactly the same way as your or my contribution would be. Um, so those people can still be pretty good-sized players in the game. Um, one of the good examples of that was, uh, was uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. If you went and looked at the NBC report on her, she had $12 million in, in her uh, campaign account. But $10 million of it was actually left over from her Senate run. Okay, she actually only raised $2 million as a presidential candidate. They, now, she's still sitting on $10 million. They, what she does with it will be interesting. She can use it for her next Senate campaign. She can help distribute it to other campaigns in the state. Uh, she may want to support uh, Anthony Brandese next door, let's say. Um, so she may 
they want to, but she can do that. She cannot turn it into personal income okay, at this point. But they can sit on it for a long, long time. Okay, they are absolutely. Okay, uh, now, what's happening with these folks, again, those who feel under attack from the potential uh, progressive Democrats, they don't necessarily like Trump. They're pretty clear about that. They don't like his personality. They don't particularly like what he's doing. But they do like his business-friendly policies. Okay, so, uh, so he is managing to win, particularly given some of the potential alternatives. Um, some of these former, again, either neutral or Democratic business uh, associates are opening up uh, to a Republican fundraiser. Uh, and that's, that's an interesting idea. Okay, it's an interesting idea. It's not new. Okay, it's happened in the past. Trump raised, oh, so far for his presidential run, $245 million. Okay, now, if you remember, in 2016, he was struggling to raise $40 million. Okay, and really didn't get really big contributions until literally the last month okay, of the campaign. This is an enormous amount of money for this stage of the campaign. Okay, $245 million. He's already spent $170 million. Okay, on all sorts of uh, ads, uh, things like that, salaries, polls, things like that. Uh, so he's already spent more than most of his Democratic uh, uh, competitors are, are raising. Okay, that's, that's an enormous amount of money. Again, he has the advantage of not having to go after rivals within the party. Uh, likewise, contributors have no one else in the party to really give to. They want to give to the party, there's your choice. Okay, and many of them are doing that. Um, so he's really at a real interesting advantage. Uh, he can use that money to fire up his base. Who pays for all these rallies that he goes to and, and Southern Holes? And that's, that's an important part of his campaign money. Now, keep in mind, money isn't everything. Okay, the Clinton campaign in 2016 had six times as much money as Trump did and spent in some states 20 times what he spent and still lost. Okay, so money's not everything, but it sure helps. Okay, it sure helps. Bernie is actually sitting on $73 million. Okay, it's an enormous amount of money, and he has done that without a super PAC. If you really look, super PACs generally account for about 10 to 20 percent of a candidate's money. But when you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars, that's a lot of money. But he refuses to have a super PAC. There actually is a Bernie PAC. He does not run it directly out of his campaign, because he's not really allowed to do that. Uh, but it does raise some money for him. But his support, comes mostly from small donations, $200 and less, from an incredibly broad base of very fanatic fans. And to raise $73 million that way, you are a power source in the party. And that, that's a powerful statement. Um, again, his funding has reportedly slowed down. Um, some people are now starting to look at Elizabeth Warren more seriously. Uh, which one actually might be able to defeat uh, Donald Trump in the, uh, in the fall of, of next year. Uh, she has a lot of the same ideas. She sort of lifted some of his. She's added some of her own. Uh, so there has been now some competition for that donor base on the progressive left. Uh, and also his heart attack certainly didn't help mm -hmm. at, at his age. He is the oldest of the candidates. He'll be 79 okay, um, if he is elected. That would be our oldest um, elected president at that point. But still, he has a huge amount of money. $73 million is a lot of campaign money. Okay? And it will remain a factor. Now, uh, if you were paying attention over the weekend, uh, Cortez, uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez endorsed him at a rally in, in Queens. It'll be interesting to see if that matters with fundraising. Okay? Uh, are, uh, does, does she have that sort of fundraising base nationally that's going to enhance what he has? Um, it certainly enhanced his standing in the party as the progressive candidate, uh, but it, it, how it affects fundraising will be interesting. Um, it may actually benefit her fundraising more than his, okay, to, be, to be in that relationship. So it'll be interesting to see um, how that uh, plays out. The biggest Democratic surge recently has been Elizabeth Warren, and there's absolutely no question about that. Uh, she has taken over the top spot in most of the polls, not by a lot, 23 to 22 over Biden in this poll, 26 to 24 in another one, things like that. But she has raised also an enormous amount of money, about $60 million. She has spent about $34 million, and as, of course, time goes on and she has rivals, she's going to have to spend more of it on campaigning against fellow Democrats than she's going to be able to spend 
campaigning against uh, Trump and the Republicans. If she wins the nomination, one of her biggest challenges is going to be to try to sway those very dedicated Bernie voters to her side, both for their vote and for their financial support. And they did not do that for Hillary Clinton in 2016. And there's no guarantee that they'll do it for Elizabeth Warren either. And in spite of her anti-business rhetoric, they, uh, she may well, especially if she can't capture those contributors, she may well have to start reaching out to the big Democratic contributors, which includes things uh, like banks and businesses and insurance companies and the so-called 1%. And, and we'll see if she does that. Uh, these are enormously expensive campaigns. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and if you don't have it, you're not going to campaign effectively. So we'll see how she reacts and what happens. And how they respond to her will be interesting as well. And are they really going to just sort of say, oh, okay, good. Hey, uh, we, we don't really believe your rhetoric. We're going to give you a lot of money. Uh, hold your breath. We'll see what happens. Uh, one of the interesting candidates in this race uh, is Mayor Pete. Uh, he has not seriously challenged the top three yet, although he's creeping up on Bernie. Uh, he's still way behind in most of the polls, uh, but he is raising incredible amounts of money. He has raised $50 million uh, in his campaign. And his, his is interesting because it's uh, almost a 50-50 split with sort of the Bernie plan, uh, small contributors up to $200, and some of the traditional big Democratic donors. And it's, it's about 50-50. It's a little bit larger on the $200 side. Uh, but he's exciting a base, which is also uh, true. Uh, he's well ahead of Joe Biden. Joe Biden is way down at $36 million. Uh, so he's way ahead of Biden, and he's closing <laughs> in on Warren in fundraising. And that, that's kind of interesting. With the amount of money he has, uh, he should be able to hold out probably to New Hampshire, at least. And that's the hope of his campaign. He's still running between 6 and 10 percent in polls, you know, fairly significantly third, fourth, fifth, and even sixth and some. Uh, but with that amount of money, he should be able to go and then hope again that Iowans will turn out in his favor and then New Hampshireites uh, as well. So uh, we'll see. It's an interesting campaign. But again, follow the money. Okay, the money is important. Here's the biggest candidate you don't know. <laughs> That's Tom Steyer. He's been around for a long time. He's a hedge fund billionaire. Uh, he is a major Democratic uh, donor. He was one of the three largest single donors to Hillary Clinton's campaign. Been a long-standing big Democratic uh, 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 contributor. Interestingly enough, his hedge fund partner is a big Republican contributor. <laughs> so they sort of cancel each other out, and, uh, which is really interesting. But he actually entered the race, just remember a few weeks ago, but he entered the race with $49 million, and which really is an expression of his reach into the business community. This is not his own money. He, is, he's, he has that type of money, and he has not put his own money up um, at this point. Now, he's a billionaire, but he's trying to run on the whole populist line, let's get the rich out of politics. And, uh, how far that's going to go is anybody's guess. Uh, what's really his biggest problem is name recognition. And nobody really knows who he is, and, and, uh, except that he's a big former donor. And, and that may or may not carry him. The fact is his money is going to carry him. They, uh, he will, unless he chooses not to run, his money will certainly carry him to Iowa, if not New Hampshire. <laughs> they, and then see from there. And again, how much money can he spread around in those states, get his name out there, uh, get some policies that people agree with. Uh, he is generally considered a, a moderate when it comes to policy. And obviously, as a business person, he's not business hostile. Okay, so, so he's got some interesting potential. Again, biggest problem, name recognition. Nobody knows who he is. Okay, and that's, that's interesting. Joe Biden, who is sitting at the top of the polls, most of them are in second place, has really not excited a lot of donors. He's got $36 million. Oh, by the way, these figures are all as of last Friday. Okay, uh, so it's, it's not like three months ago. This is, these are current. Okay, uh, but he's not attracting huge amounts of, of money. Okay? And most of his donors are the big traditional Democratic voters uh, and donors, uh, where he's very, very popular. Uh, he has not really excited that base, particularly the Bernie base, okay? uh, younger voters and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and his support has been eroding slowly but surely in the polls, 
That also generally means an erosion of money. They, uh, the good big donors will hold back. They, they don't want to spend a lot of money on somebody that's not going to get the nomination, um, so they'll wait. So that, as he declines in the polls, his fundraising also uh, goes south a little bit as well. Still, that may not say much. He is enormously popular with Democrats over 50 and Democrats over 50 vote. Okay? And so that's an important block. And it doesn't matter who those Democrats over 50 are. Okay? He is very popular uh, with white suburban Democrats. He is very popular with black rural Democrats. Uh, he has very long roots into the Democratic establishment because he's been around so long. They, uh, everybody knows him. Uh, the, uh, some wisdom say, well, Camilla Harris as a black candidate has a real advantage in South Carolina. She doesn't. He does. They, uh, again, black voters over 50 in South Carolina are overwhelmingly supporters of Joe Biden. They, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how he makes out in that. Um, and frankly, becoming the underdog might be helpful. They, again, if you're a business interest they, and you want to stay in the Democratic fold, they, and Elizabeth Warren is giving all this anti-business rhetoric, you want to support a candidate they, who's going to topple her, if possible. So that may work uh, to Biden's advantage. Okay, uh, we'll see. And it's hard to be the leader. Okay? It's, it's hard to be the leader. Oh, his, age. his age is a factor. He's 78. Okay? And uh, so that's, uh, it, it'll see. Uh, the, all three leading candidates on both sides are in their 70s. Okay? And uh, that's, that's interesting. But again, the most reliable voters in this country are over 50. Okay? So, and, and we who are over, over, over 50 okay, uh, are even more reliable. Okay, so, uh, so, and, and there's still a lot of us, okay, so we're still a factor. Um, Camilla Harris has a lot of money, about $36 million, uh, but she's flat, both in the polls and in fundraising recently, okay, and that, that has not helped her. She's also spent a lot of her money. She's already spent $25 million of that, so she's only sitting on about $10.5 million at this point. The hope for her is that she will have enough money to carry her to South Carolina, where it's hoped that, again, about half of the registered Democrats in South Carolina our minority voters, uh, and it's hoped that that will give her a nice surge. Again, the Biden factor there is huge. Uh, can she break over that? Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. It's a very tall order. Uh, so we'll see where she goes. She will make it to the first rounds. What's the possibility that Kamala would be a vice president candidate with Biden? Wouldn't that be a strong? It might be. It might be. It's too early to see who's going to be the vice president because we have no idea who's going to be the presidential candidate. Uh, and there, there are lots of reasons to choose um, a variety of candidates. Uh, you might need somebody else for a regional purpose. Um, you might want somebody with certain experience. Um, if you have another senator, having two senators run is not necessarily a good idea. Okay, you would want the governor in there, somebody with executive experience. Uh, there's, there's a lot of factors yet. Uh, it is, uh, for some, that's the dream ticket. Okay, uh, we'll see. Biden, again, it's going to be up to him. Usually the candidate pretty much gets who they want. Okay, so, so we'll see. If she keeps attacking him, okay, I don't see him <laughs> turning over and inviting her to be in the uh, <laughs> by any means. Um, it would be interesting. She's certainly in the, in the running for that consideration. The rest of them are in trouble, basically. They all have money. Uh, between about 15 and 18 million dollars for the next few candidates. Um, that's not a lot at a national level when it comes right down to it. Uh, none of them has created much of a spark. None of them are over 3% in any poll at this point. Uh, a couple of regional polls, yes. And, uh, and again, their money is pretty flat at this point. Uh, both O'Rourke and Klobuchar have not yet qualified for the next debate. And, and, and they may not. Uh, it's, it comes down at this point, they, they both have money, but they don't have the polling okay, at this point. Because you need to, again, you need to be a certain percentage in either four uh, regional polls or two national polls. Okay? And right now, neither one of them are there. Uh, Booker and Yang are in uh, for the next one, but they are now really the bottom tier candidates. Uh, if they can't gain traction soon, uh, they'll be out. Okay? And uh, again, they'll lose their contributors, okay? uh, so it'll be interesting. Um, and, of course, that also allows them, because they're at the bottom of the tier, it allows them to be the most interesting candidates. Okay, they don't have to be safe in what they say. Okay, they, they can say what they want to say. So somebody like Andrew Yang is really interesting. Excites a lot of younger voters. 
a, uh, with, with what he says. Uh, but, uh, but he's probably not really electable. Uh, it would be interesting. Now, when we look at money, and you always look at money, we still have 13 months before the election, and already $621 million has been raised for just the president's race. And we're still a year out. Okay, this is more than was raised for the 2016 election. And this has been raised so far. We will definitively pass the billion dollar mark for just the presidential race. Okay, you need to ask what's being bought. Okay, what are we paying for? Okay, somebody's paying a lot of money. Okay, what do they want? Okay, and that's a perfectly legitimate question. And there's obviously, uh, from both sides, a great deal at stake here. That's why the money is coming in. And again, on the Republican side, there's a lot of fear among large businesses, corporations, about the potential of a progressive Democratic president. And on the Democratic side, they don't want four more years of Trump. And so there's a lot of money pouring into this. Um, and always keep track of the money. Uh, just as a recommendation, probably the easiest site to do it is a site called opensecrets.org. Uh, or if you so choose, you can go to the very obtuse Federal Election Commission site uh, and get the same information. Uh, open Secrets updates uh, as the FEC updates. Uh, generally, it's, it's quarterly. The candidates have to report. They do have to report some things monthly as well. Uh, but that's, it's an easy site to navigate. It's an easy site to get. It also has interesting articles on it. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty good site. Uh, they also track local elections uh, down to congressional level. You won't get like county executive here. Uh, but if you want to follow and see what uh, John Katko is up to, or Anthony Brandisi, or anybody else in any state uh, race uh, that's, that's uh, congressional, you can follow that too. Uh, so it's, it's a good site. It's a good site. There are going to be enormous amounts of money spent on Senate races this year also. There were last time too. Uh, the uh, race with Cruz and O'Rourke uh, was the most expensive Senate race ever. They had over $100 million spent on that. Um, some of the House races, uh, the, the Brandisi race was uh, brought in a lot of money, but it was the one in the Mid-Hudson District uh, that actually was very expensive, something to the tune of $20 million spent in that district for a congressional seat. That's, that's enormous. Okay, uh, right now, there are 35 seats up. There are 33 uh, in the usual rotation, and there are two special elections uh, up this year as well. <clears throat> 23 are Republican, 12 are Democratic. Um, and, but most of them are considered safe seats. They, they, there really isn't a huge expectation of, of a huge leap one way or another. You never know, okay, but it's not expected. Um, in order to flip the Senate, the Democrats need to hold all of their seats and get either three or four Republican seats, three if they win the presidency, because then the vice president is on your side, four if they don't. Okay, that's actually a pretty tall order okay, uh, at this point. Again, partly because of the idea of safe seats. The seats right now most apt to flip. There are three Republican seats and one Democratic seat. Um, Colorado, uh, which right now is Cory Gardner, is this guy here in the center. Um, they, he's a Republican, but Colorado is one of those states that is shifting. It's got a very young population, and they have had an enormous inflow of Hispanic voters who tend to vote Democrat, okay, and, uh, as, do, as do younger ones. So he's considered to be a viable target. He's not especially unpopular in Colorado, uh, but uh, a good candidate. And as far as I know, there is not, uh, he doesn't have a solid candidate against him yet. There's a primary coming up. Uh, a good candidate may be able to unseat him. So, uh, so that's one. Uh, the uh, Martha McSally, remember, lost a very close race in Arizona last year, and then was appointed to fill out John McCain's seat. Um, she, is being, she has a serious Democratic challenger, uh, but she's also being challenged from within the party. So it'll be interesting to see. Again, that's considered to be a vulnerable seat uh, in Arizona. Another state that, that has been red for a long time and is now sort of falling into the purple category as more and more people uh, go out there. We hear here in the Northeast that, there's, uh, that Susan Collins is vulnerable. There's a lot of outside money pouring into Maine. Uh, she is still six to one ahead in fundraising. And that's generally a sign of strength. And uh, so she may or may not be as vulnerable uh, as, as folks think. It remains to be seen. They, uh, again, it's, it's interesting. But if we follow money, not foolproof, 
but money's a pretty good indicator of popularity as well. Uh, so she may or may not be as vulnerable as we think. One who is definitively uh, vulnerable is this man, Doug Jones. Okay, uh, he defeated Roy Moore, which was not that big of a task, even in Alabama. Uh, but can he hold the seat? Okay, and that depends. Roy Moore wants to be back as the candidate. Okay, uh, and, and of course, Doug Jones is probably going, oh, please. <laughs> uh, but in fact, if, if uh, uh, Alabama puts up a more rational Republican candidate, uh, this is a state that, that Trump won by almost 30 percentage points. Okay, so it's going to be very difficult for Jones to hold the seat. Uh, and uh, and he's, again, he's not a bad senator necessarily, uh, but, but he's facing an uphill battle. So, uh, so this, these are the most likely seats. And even these are not 100% guaranteed by, by any means. The Senate is going to be very important uh, because the president elected in 2020 may well get to choose two Supreme Court justices. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 86. She has had some health issues. She's still looking pretty good. She maintains that she has no plans to retire. Uh, that is uh, certainly a, a hope uh, for those who support her on the, on the bench. Uh, the next oldest judge is Justice Breyer, um, her fellow court liberal. He is 81. Uh, he has made some overtures that he doesn't want to be on the bench forever, okay, but he also has not made any overtures that he's going to retire any moment too soon either. But again, their age is certainly a factor. Four more years is a long time. Okay, so uh, again, even with a Democratic uh, president, if they don't get a Democratic Senate, they, uh, we're going to have interesting court battles. They, and, uh, and again, there'll be court battles regardless. Uh, but these two, this is, this is a factor in the election. Uh, how big a factor is, is really interesting. In the 2016 election, this was the number three concern of Republicans. It was not even in the top ten for Democrats. They, uh, that is probably different this time around. They, and uh, so, so we'll see uh, where, where that goes. The House will probably remain Democratic, but it is early. Okay, we'll see. The impeachment proceedings are going to be important in that. We'll talk about that in a minute. There are 18 Democratic seats considered toss-ups. Even if the Democrats lose all 18 of them, they'll still have a majority. They, uh, but they're considered toss-ups, including the one next door to us in the 22nd District. Uh, Anthony Brandisi won a very, very tight election by a few hundred votes uh, in what traditionally is a very red district. They, he is a blue dog Democrat. Uh, if you actually follow him and read his stuff, he is being very careful. Okay, he understands clearly uh, that leaning too far left, he is not going to be reelected. Okay, and he also is not a Republican. So he's, he's really interesting. He's a blue dog Democrat. He's actually the vice chair of that, that uh, small caucus group. Um, and he's, he's towing a very, very careful line because he has to, okay, if he wants to succeed in that district. Again, he only won by a few hundred votes. Okay, um, so so it, it's interesting to see. Uh, same thing is true with Katko. Katko is a little more solid than Brandisi is. Okay, um, and uh, again, his strength, uh, he lost on Onondaga County by about 1,000 votes. But remember, this district is more than Onondaga County, okay? something that local Democrats have not learned, frankly. Okay? Uh, you still have to show up in Oswego, Wayne, and Cayuga County, and that's where Katko won by 15,000 votes. Okay? Uh, and, and again, uh, the last Democratic candidate uh, Dana Balter, it's far. I live in Oswego County. I'm not aware that she ever set foot in the county. Okay, uh, and, and that's a huge mistake. It's the same mistake that was made in the elections before that okay, as well. That said, I fully expect after 2020 census that I will be put back into the Adirondacks okay, uh, <laughs> to, get, uh, to get those 8,000 Republican votes out of this district okay, uh, and put them up in the Adirondacks where they don't matter. It's just 8,000 more Republican votes. Okay, uh, that's how much Cat uh, uh, um, won by in Oswego County. Okay, so, uh, so we'll see what, uh, what reapportionment does in that. Uh, are the debates helping or hurting? Excellent question. And, and uh, we don't know, but it certainly there's uh, some information out there. Okay, well, it's true that this is bringing the Democratic candidates a lot of free publicity. Mm -hmm. okay, they don't have to pay for that time. Uh, that they're on the, the national networks. Uh, it also is exposing a lot of internal bickering that probably is helping Donald Trump, to be honest with you. Okay? And uh, it, it shows big cracks in the Democratic Party, as it did in the Republican Party four years ago, when you had the 16 candidates up there. And it's, it's probably not helping. And by sniping at each other's plans and proposals now, you're giving the other side the ammunition. And, uh, if I'm a Republican strategist, 
I could run an ad now of Pete Buttigieg if Elizabeth Warren gets to be the candidate. I could run uh, Mayor Pete tearing down her program. Who's going to pay for this? I'm not sure Republican. Okay, I can do that. And it will be done. Okay, it will be done. So uh, are they helping themselves here or hurting themselves? Uh, they may well be helping Trump whose actually support is solidifying uh, in face of the impeachment hearings. Okay, and it's, it's not eroding away uh, as many thought it would. Uh, so that's, that's a serious contention and a serious problem uh, that these debates have. Being a front runner is a mixed blessing. Just ask Joe Biden. Okay? And while it was him, he had the big target on his back. Remember the first two debates, everybody's sniping at Joe Biden. Okay? And uh, now the last one, a little bit less, Hey, because Elizabeth Warren was now the one uh, wearing the target. Uh, but in fact, uh, there are some factors that, his age being one of them, he has made some uh, interesting slips and gaffes uh, on the campaign trail, misquoted people, uh, said different things at different places. Uh, is that age related? Is it just because you've got enormous amounts of coverage? That's part of it. He is also, uh, there's some unanticipated collateral damage from the Ukraine hearings. Uh, uh, Kent's testimony, particularly last week, cast a lot of State Department doubt on Hunter Biden. Okay, that was not what the Democratic uh, committee members wanted to hear, uh, but it was out there anyway. Okay, and uh, so, so there are those questions. How much they'll haunt him, anybody's guess. But they don't help. They, they don't help. Uh, again, very intense media coverage when you're the leader uh, doesn't necessarily help because it exposes every potential mistake you make. Okay, when you're not the leader anymore, you can get away with more stuff. Okay, so as he fades from the, the lead, at least at this point, that may actually help his campaign. Most political analysts right now are giving him the best chance of unseating Trump, okay, uh, still, as, as a national candidate. Now that, that may well change, of course. It's still early. When the lead passed to Elizabeth Warren, all of a sudden she wasn't able to get away with just saying, I have a plan. Okay, that, that's nice, because now you have other candidates saying, how are we going to pay for your plan? Who's going to be taxed? Okay, and it's, it's nice to say, I'm going to tax the 1% or the billionaires or whoever. Nobody seriously believes that. They, uh, they just don't. They, uh, those people, even if they pay large amounts of taxes, they're not going to pay for the, uh, a program like this. Uh, Klobuchar attacked her plans as pipe dreams. Hey, and the two of them, by the way, are, are supposed to be friends. And, uh, and so that, that was very unfriendly. Buttigieg actually has, is the one that asked the question that everybody else is asking. Who's going to pay for especially Medicare for all? <coughs> hey, right now, you have several groups on both sides of the aisle that are saying that Medicare for all would cost us $32 trillion in the next 10 years. Hey, uh, that's an unbelievable amount of money. That's four times the national debt right now. And, and, and she, of course, dodged that. She kept saying, well, costs are going to go down. He kept saying, that's not what it asked. They, you know, who's paying for it? Uh, and and that's, that's going to be a problem for her, especially as, as a leader. Bernie, by the way, has been right up front about it. I'm going to raise taxes. Okay? And that's how we're going to pay for it. Okay? And uh, so you know, those, those at the, the bottom of the basis, baseline supporters, don't care. Hey, those of us hey, at the other end might think twice about that. This is kind of, kind of interesting. It feeds the progressive base to claim that the rich are going to pay, they are the 1% <coughs> are going to pay, or billionaires are going to pay, or we're going to raise corporate taxes. Um, that's nice, but realistically, again, nobody really believes that. They, so who's going to pay? Well, the 5%, many of us sitting in this room are the 5%. They, we are certainly the 10% in this country. Look at national income figures. Okay, uh, it's a lot lower than you think. Okay, even next door again in Oswego <laughs> County, the average household income in Oswego County is $39,000. Okay, that's the household income. 22% okay, poverty, uh, unemployment rate, 22% uh, underemployment rate right next door to us. Okay, and, and who's going to pay? Okay, uh, so that's, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So uh, we who are sitting at the, at the higher income levels, we're up higher than, than we think. We're not billionaires. Okay? At least I don't know. Anybody a billionaire? <laughs> I can use them all. No, no. Uh, but, uh, but no. But, but even with us, us sitting here, most of us would fall into the 10% okay, uh, of, of wealthiest Americans. It's interesting. Um, stuff like free college tuition, nobody believes that. Okay? Nobody, somebody's going to pay. 
Okay, uh, debt forgiven, $1.2 trillion in student debt. They, are banks just suddenly going to say, oh yeah, we'll take that hit? No. And they, it's going to have to be paid for by, if these federal programs go through, taxation. Okay, and there's no way to get around that. That is probably not going to sit well with the valuable swing voters, uh, particularly suburban women okay, who are educated. They, uh, you know, can't sell them on a free lunch. Okay, and that's not going to happen. And as these plans start to get uh, really examined, which again, if Elizabeth Warren becomes the candidate or the leader, she's going to have to answer a lot more questions. Uh, that, that can be the kiss of death. Okay? Even if it's true that you're going to raise taxes, remember George Bush. Okay? Read my lips. No new taxes. As soon as he raised taxes, he was a dead candidate. He's done. Okay? Uh, got defeated by an unknown, Bill Clinton. Okay? Uh, so that, that's a serious issue. So uh, you know, they're going to have to give some serious thought to that. The real question for Democrats okay, is who can bring in favorable voters in all these yellow states? Okay? If, in fact, Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg can attract a million more voters and they're in New York and California, who cares? Okay? They're absolutely irrelevant there. If you need to attract a million more voters, they need to be in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in Michigan, okay, that's where the action is, okay, and that's the question. Who can take these states? Now, right now, based on the last five elections, and you can really go back a lot further than that, uh, any Democratic candidate uh, will have to end up with about 195 electoral votes. As Nancy Pelosi so poetically said herself, in many districts you can run a glass of water with a D on it, and it will win. Okay, the same is true in Republican districts. Okay, and uh, you know, we can talk about that another time. Republican candidate can reliably count on about 179. Okay, so the rest of these yellow ones uh, are the ones that are actually in play. They have all switched at least once in the last five election cycles. Okay, so, so these are the, are the battleground states. Okay, who can win these states? Okay, that's really what's going to matter uh, and matter most. And, uh, and that, that will be interesting. Where does impeachment fall into this? Uh, this is a huge gamble. Okay, and one that Nancy Pelosi resisted for a long time. Um, it's, it's an enormous gamble. First of all, impeachment itself is a very vague constitutional concept. It's there. We know it's there. It's actually mentioned three separate times in the Constitution. But what the heck is a high crime and misdemeanor? Okay, we all know what treason is. We all know what bribery is. Okay, what is a high crime and misdemeanor? Nobody knows. Okay, uh, Speaker Pelosi, in this case, and many of the moderate Democrats, did not jump on the impeachment bandwagon uh, because they want a charge that the public will understand clearly, okay, that, that is so clear you can't argue it. They haven't found that. Okay? The obstruction is confusing. Okay? What exactly is, is obstruction? It's often in the eye of the beholder. Now, there are definitive criminal obstructions as well. Okay? Was that line crossed? If it was, you'd have an impeachment already. Okay, uh, so the, the Mueller report, um, except for the most ardent anti-Trumpers, was not clear. Okay, there was a lot of effort to say, well, there's clearly 10 impeachable offenses in this. Mueller himself basically said, no, they're not. Okay, and it's, it's, it's not so. Okay, and, and, and all of us need to take our, our particular political biases on both sides off when you read these different reports. It's not as clear, otherwise we would have results. The whole idea of abuse of power. And that, okay, good. Everybody understands abuse of power. No, they don't. Okay? No, they don't. Okay? And, and it, it isn't. Our founders specifically avoided that term. Okay? It was considered, should we put abuse of power in there? The problem is, what's real abuse and what's behavior the political opposition doesn't like? Okay? What constitutes actual abuse of power? Um, when does abuse become a high crime or misdemeanor? Okay? Uh, it, it, is it just somebody poorly executing power? Okay? Is it actual abuse of power? Is there actually a legal definition of abuse of power that fits a constitutional cause? Okay? If there was, we'd know it. Okay? Uh, there are on both sides. Okay? They both have a completely different view uh, of what this is. Okay? And when does unethical behavior cross the line into criminality? Okay, there are very few people that are going to tell you that a Ukraine phone call wasn't unethical. Okay, was it illegal is another question. 
and not a clear one. Okay, not a clear one. Okay, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, the hope was to avoid a strictly partisan process. Can we find something that we can start swinging some Republicans onto this bandwagon as well? Uh, the answer so far is, is no. And it doesn't help that two of the leaders are Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler, uh, who really are ultra-partisans. Um, if you go back in, in uh, Schiff's history particularly, um, he's, he was the revenge candidate for uh, Clinton's impeachment in 1996. Uh, the man he replaced was one of the uh, House prosecutors against Bill Clinton. So Schiff was put up specifically to defeat him. Okay? And, and it's, it's really been partisan for the last 20 years. And both of them have been calling for <laughs> impeachment since about uh, January 21st. Okay? Uh, so so they, you know, how much validity do they have uh, in the general public is, is an interesting question. Trump supporters are big bolstered by conservative talk radio. Okay? And whether you like it or not, you should listen to it occasionally. Okay? Um, last night, for example, I, and I just happened to have it on, I don't like Sean Hannity, but it, you have to listen once in a while. He had McCarthy on, the uh, minority um, uh, leader of the House. He had a whole different story about the Nancy Pelosi finger in the face picture of Donald Trump. Okay? And a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republicans listened to Hannity. So what story do they hear? They, uh, it was a completely different take on that uh, than what we saw uh, in most of the media. So it, it, it really do. If you want to really, you have to occasionally, even if it, whichever side you're on, it doesn't really matter. You have to listen to what the other side is saying, too, uh, to get some ideas. Uh, but they've dug in. And they're talking about a huge fishing expedition here. Um, and the endless hearings are not producing anything clear. They, and a lot of the public is telling you outright, if they had something clear, we'd know it. They, but they don't. The closed door hearings don't necessarily help. Now, the Republicans who are screaming about that are just as guilty. They were doing the same thing two years ago. They, and, you know, whatever rules you make that you think are going to favor you now are inevitably going to come out and bite you when you're no longer the majority. They, and, and that's exactly what's happening right now. Uh, so it's interesting. Um, and to be honest with you, again, voter fatigue. How much, how much can you cover these things Okay, these kind of obtuse hearings before you just bore the public okay, and they don't care any longer. Okay, and it's, it doesn't help with public clarity. There was a really interesting, uh, they did get a little bit of coverage, obviously, from ABC. Uh, just at the time of the debate, which took place in Ohio, uh, they did an interesting thing. They took a road trip. They started right in the core of downtown Columbus and drove 100 miles along one of the, uh, sort of one of the secondary roads. Uh, in Ohio, and they randomly stopped and talked to people, okay, anybody that would talk to them. So they, they were in Columbus, uh, which is largely a Democratic city. Uh, they went into some of the purple suburbs. Uh, Westerly was one of them where the debates took place. Went into some rural areas. Uh, the general view, the president should be held accountable, but there's no sense of outrage at his behavior. Okay? That's, that's interesting. It's like, okay, you know, he's a politician. Well, politicians do that. They, uh, whether they do it ethically or not is, is a question. Very few people could actually give any details about the Ukraine phone call at all, and none of them could name the leader of the Ukraine. Okay, so how significant an issue is that in the general American public? Okay, good question. Okay, good question. One interviewee expressed that whole idea of voter fatigue. There's a lot of ways in which information is getting filtered in a bunch of different ways. A man named Michael Cole, middle-aged manager from a trucking company. I don't really have time for it. So it's like white noise in the background. They have this daily, again, deluge. This is their words, not mine. Of this daily deluge of headlines coming out of Washington. I don't know who to trust anymore. That's the really the bottom line. How many Americans does he speak for? Okay, my suspicion is a lot. Okay, my suspicion is, is a lot. That issue is not new. Okay, what's a crisis inside the Beltway may not be a crisis anywhere else in the country. Okay, and you've got two big news centers outside of Washington, New York City and Los Angeles. Again, what's a crisis there may not be a crisis in Oklahoma. Okay, or, for that matter, in Yonkers. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting problem. 24-7 news is very competitive. Okay, you're vying with all of these other news agencies for the same limited set of dollars advertising money. You've got to have something that's going to get people to watch your network, so you've got to make the news as exciting as possible. And, and so we hear these really interesting words. 
is every revelation in Congress explosive? <coughs> if I hear NBC News use the word explosive one more time, <laughs> they, uh, I, they're going to hear my scream in New York City. They, uh, because everything is explosive. They, it's not. They, it's not. And by telling you that, that word then becomes meaningless. So as they project these ideas, and you start saying, well, geez, it's really not that important. That voter fatigue, apathy, boredom set in. They, it, it's a real problem. Um, the impeachment coverage is also tapping into very recent hostility towards the so-called mainstream media uh, by, again, mostly the conservative side. Okay? And that, that's not helping. Okay? That's not helping. Okay? And uh, so it's, it's a real, it's a gamble. Okay? It's a gamble. Um, and this is their conclusion, uh, this ABC News thing. As clear as House Democrats might think they have found, uh, they, we found healthy skepticism about the politics surrounding the process, doubts about the ability of the media to fairly present facts, and concern about the potential impact a successful impeachment vote might have. Okay, that's, that's powerful. And it came from, again, a, a probably one of the best types of polls you can have, a random, a, in, a, in a select area. Kind of interesting. Given that highly partisan nature of, of uh, Washington politics, the impeachment is almost inevitable. Okay, we're we're going to see an impeachment. Okay, uh, everyone has been, has been a partisan issue. Okay, going all the way back to Andrew Johnson. Not new. Okay, it's not new. There are always partisan issues. Okay, and, uh, and it is interesting. So let's look at what Nancy Pelosi is looking at. Okay, we've got a few minutes, if it's all right with you. Um, here's a scenario. Okay, the House impeaches, Senate convicts. Trump is removed from office. That's all they can do to him. Okay, other agencies can go into criminal uh, issues that they want. Um, at this point, probably unlikely. They, uh, the, Senate, uh, the Senate probably isn't going to do that. 20 Republicans would have to cross over. Okay? All the Democrats would have to hold fast. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. Okay? Probably not going to happen. Uh, partly because the damage to the Republican Party would be significant. Even if Republicans don't like Trump, which a lot of them don't, okay? it would damage the party. So it's unlikely. Uh, Mike Pence takes over as president for the rest of the term. He would be able to run for president twice. Okay, so you could have Mike Pence for nine years, okay, uh, legally, uh, as, as president. Okay, so that's an interesting scenario. Another scenario, House uh, impeaches, Senate acquits. Likely there, Trump loses the next general election. Democrats regain the Senate. Possible, not a sure bet by any means. Again, um, at this point, Senate conviction is highly unlikely. Um, this scenario assumes outrage at the Republicans. That may not happen. It, it, and certainly early indications are, are not. The Democratic candidate is going to be a huge factor. They instant, uh, you're not going to get instant Democrats out of Republicans and Independents just because Trump is impeached. And that's not going to happen. And so the candidate still matters in, in, in these scenarios. Another scenario, House impeaches, Senate quits, Trump is re-elected. Okay, this is possible. Okay, and right now, according to most of the polls, this is likely. Okay, uh, so so this, this is a disaster uh, if, you're, uh, if you're Nancy Pelosi. The only thing that would make it worse is losing the House, okay, which probably isn't going to happen at this point. Um, impeachment is not a guarantee of a Democratic White House. Okay, and it's not a guarantee of conviction, okay, especially if there are not really ironclad, concrete, clear charges, okay, which at the moment there are not. Okay, at the moment they're not. Okay, uh, the, you're gonna, it does guarantee angry Trump supporters who vote. Okay, who vote. Okay, so, so that's something you have to consider. Again, who's the opposing candidate? It's going to be very important in that. Another possibility has been discussed. The House drops impeachment and decides some sort of official reprimand. That has been discussed by particularly vulnerable Democrats like Anthony Brandisi. Okay, uh, you know, if, if I vote to impeach Trump, I probably can kiss my election goodbye. Okay, and uh, there, there are about 32 Democrats in the House and several in the Senate that are sitting in those pro-Trump districts. The Senate most certainly is going to quit at this point, so impeachment becomes a mute protest, much like the Clinton impeachment was. And if you remember, after the impeachment, Clinton's, uh, Clinton's numbers went up, not down. Okay, and Republicans paid a price for that. They didn't lose control of the House, but they did not win the seats that they expected to win. Okay, so the blowback factor uh, is, is in there as well. 
The other problem with this, there's no such thing as a constitutional rubber band. Okay, they're, they're, and that was brought up, remember, the Clinton in, um, impeachment as well. Yeah, there, there's, there's no such thing. <laughs> you also have to consider, and love Ruffy Cat, she is no longer with us, unfortunately, hey, but uh, a lot of fun. The impeachment move definitely has the undercurrent of revenge for the Clinton impeachment, which in turn had the tinge of revenge for the Nixon impeachment, in part because the same people are there. They, uh, a lot of these people were there for the Clinton impeachment. They're now in, in seats of power. Um, how much of this is a revenge factor? And I will predict for you, the next Democratic president who is sitting with a Republican House literally better be Mother Teresa. <laughs> because there will be an impeachment inquiry. Guarantee it. And if you remember back, if Hillary Clinton had been elected, there are already 30 Republicans who had signed on to articles of impeachment against her. And, and so, you know, this is the political way right now. Okay, there was talk about impeaching Obama, there was talk about impeaching Bush, and so forth. This is the political way. And that revenge factor is, is very likely. Most important issue in the voting republic, the economy, without question. It's not going to be the impeachment. It's not going to be the Supreme Court. It's literally going to be your own wallet. And that's one of the truisms of American politics. People vote with their wallets. They, how are you doing? And how do you think you will be doing if this person is elected? And that is going to drive the most voters. Yes, you get some people that vote the ecology. You get some people who are going to vote uh, you know, various, various philosophies and such. Most people are going to vote uh, on their own economic scale. Uh, strong economies usually favor the incumbent. However, most incumbents also use the strong economy in their favor. This one doesn't. Okay, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's incredible. Okay, it really is. You know, he's riding one of the strongest economic waves of the last 50 years, and it's not in any of his tweets. It's not in his official campaign material. Okay, his handlers must be going absolutely nuts. Okay, and, and again, you know, will that, will that uh, be a factor? All that said, there are some cracks beginning to appear in the Republican support for Trump. And it's probably less about the Ukraine and more in the last week especially about the abandonment to the Kurds. <coughs> that's something people understand. Okay? That's pretty clear cut. We move out, the Russians move in. Absolutely. That's clear. Okay? That's something the voting public understands and by and large is hugely unpopular with Americans. For those Republicans that would like to jump ship, and there are a bunch of them, okay, this might be the beginning of an avenue to do that. Okay, it's not impeachable. Okay, so it's not an impeachable offense. It's stupid. Okay, that's, there's no crime of being stupid. Okay, uh, but, but it's not impeachable. But it may help uh, push some over the edge if they, if they want to be. Okay, uh, if they want to be. Last word very quickly, and uh, next time I talk to you in a few months, um, I do want to spend some time talking about polls because it's very important that we educate ourselves and know a lot about how polls work. And, and frankly, most of us really don't pay a lot of attention to that. Um, there are some things that you need to be a good consumer. Uh, but first of all, what was asked? You need to see the questions yourself. Do not trust, the, well, we went on a poll that it was a fair poll. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, a lot of the polls that are out there today are what are called push polls. Mm -hmm. They, the questions are asked in such a way that there's only one answer. How bad do you think Trump is as president? <laughs> bad. Really bad. Awful. Horrendous. Unsure. 12% say unsure, so you can legitimately say 88% of people polled that Trump is doing a bad job. Those polls exist. There's actually a... a, a, a I'm losing the... Thought at the moment, uh, there's an agency on the internet that actually rates polls. It is amazing how many of them get D and F ratings. Most of them, okay, most of them, because of the way they ask questions. Who was asked? Okay, who were you asking? Who's your target group? And why did you ask that group? You should know that uh, before you evaluate uh, any poll. How was it asked? Okay, was it asked online? Not everybody's online. Okay, first of all, you're knocking out the poor, generally, okay, with online. How many people have landlines anymore? Okay, uh, was it done by landline? Um, was it done in person? Those are probably your strongest polls. Okay, uh, was it done, or was this a time poll where uh, I went to this group, two weeks later, uh, and, and you do this, and you do polling, 
Um, if you're polling a neighborhood, you don't poll every house. Generally, you poll every third house. Then when you go back the next time, you do the house next door to that one. And then the third time, you do the house next door. Okay? And that, that's generally, that, that would be a, a good poll. Okay? How is it done? How do they do it? How many people are asked? Okay, three out of four dentists recommend sugarless gum for their patients who chew gum. Did you ask four dentists? Okay, or did you ask 40 or 400? They don't tell you. They, they don't tell you. You need to know. Okay, you need to know. How broad is this sample? And if it's not a broad sample, why was it not broad? You can legitimately make predictions with a relatively small sample if your questions are good questions. Okay, and your sample still is representative, even though it might be small. Um, where was it conducted? Okay, was this a broad national poll? Was it conducted in New York City? Okay, was it conducted in the heart of strong Republican or Democratic country? Okay, there's, there's a lot of that. You have to know where okay, it was done. And then, was it a commission poll? Because there's going to be a bias. If you're paying me a million bucks to do a poll for you, I don't really want to give you negative results. Okay, uh, so, you know, is there a bias? Okay, it's, it's important information. Okay, and we'll talk more about this again. Next time I see you, uh, I do want to talk about polls because it is, it is important and stuff. And remember, folks, there's an election next month. And it's a really important election. As much as we like to say the president and Congress affect us, I got news for you, the county legislature affects you much more directly, much more often. Okay, when you need road work, you need your local taxes, whatever it happens to be, these are the elections that count. You and I are very unlikely to meet the president. We are very likely to meet our town justice for one reason or another. It might be good to know who that is and have a say in who they are. Okay? Same thing with your town clerks and all that. These are vitally important elections. So please, please, please vote this year too. Thank you very much for your time.